Good Monday morning. If you're watching this, I am on vacation. But that doesn't mean that there won't be stuff on the channel. Uh, I'm going to be posting three of these videos which are outtakes from the interviews that we did with many of the speakers at Nordic JS in October. The one you're about to see is with Vaidi Yoshi and David Korshid and uh, they are lovely people and I'm sure you're gonna love it. Over to the interview. The one you're about to see is with David Korshid and Vaidi Yoshi speaking about the value of computer science in uh, front-end development and a bunch of other things in general. They are amazing people and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this this interview. Uh, have a further Merry Christmas break and uh, over to the interview. So uh, we have David and Vaidehi. They have spoken today about really interesting subjects that are somewhat related to computer science. So welcome to our live stream. Uh, Studio. On top of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah of on course. top of the world. <laughs> exactly, it's very, very superior. So, do you want to talk any uh, something about your talk and uh, explain what you're going for and yeah, how do you feel? Yeah, because a lot of people are talking in Nordic in. Yeah. So, uh, actually, you spoke before I did, but my talk mm -hmm. this morning was about the JavaScript object model. Yes. Uh, which is interesting because a lot of us think that it's you know pretty fundamental, but you may not know how it works under the hood, so I was kind of diving into it that. It is a little bit scary though, right? I yeah, mean, it can all be. these fundamental basic things. It can be. It's like, you know, you peek under and then you're like, it oh, is. what's happening? Oh, shit, there? yeah. <laughs> close it, close it. <laughs> Actually, no, I think you should investigate. It's fun, but that was my topic this morning. That was awesome. I loved it. Yeah. What mm -hmm. about you, David? How was your talk? How was your experience of uh, speaking at Nordic Jazz again? Oh, it was so great. So I was here two years ago, yeah. too. And my talk this time was using JavaScript objects to create another fundamental concept, state machines. Nice. And using that to teach everyone how to read minds, basically. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's not ambitious at all. No, no. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, there was a, like a, we. Uh, I observed the chat, the live stream chat during your talk, and there was a lot of engagement during. Oh yeah, during, people A lot are of people asked what the hell it is, and like uh, a lot of people posting the links to X state and like I knew, but we're like Jesus Christ, this thing has a lot of npm downloads. Yeah, uh, I think it reached over one and a half million, actually. What? Most of that is Gatsby's fault, though. Oh my god. So. Uh, still, it's pretty good. Cool. So, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Did you both do like computer science in university? Where did you come from? Why did you decide to program? Yeah, um, my background is actually not in computer science at all. Woo. Uh, Yay! I studied English. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Uh, anybody here? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, That's no, awesome. but I'm like, I studied theater. Oh, yeah, yeah. Humanities. Um, so, yeah, I, I did computer science. <laughs> I'm boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's interesting. I think both are valid. Um, I think ultimately you end up having to learn some of it, and yeah. it's a question of whether you learn it in school. True. Or do you learn it because you just fell into it, or you were curious and you're like, oh, I have to learn this now. Um, but my background is like, in the humanities, right. I was a writer and a teacher, and then I went into programming. And yeah, how did you do that? Like, why did you be like into English in university, and why did you think, oh, you know what, I'm just gonna program? How did that happen? Uh, it turns out being a freelance writer is hard. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a tough. It's a tough gig. Okay. Um, but I started building my own website for my right. writing, and okay. I was like, oh, this is fun. Maybe I can add this other thing. Ah, Maybe I can awesome. add this spinner. Cool. And slowly, I just started like. Writing, okay, like so you were like into web first thing, yeah. Wow, that's yeah. Super Started cool. with web development, kind of nice. mostly still working in that. Awesome, yeah. What about you, David? So, funny enough, I went to college for piano. So, if you're wondering, the, yeah, uh, the that's my last why you're David K. Piano, exactly. Piano okay. not my last it name, it all comes down, yeah. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, we had a class at the end of, um, I guess, my senior year, and we had to create a website for ourselves, but we were using this um, iWet drag and drop thing, and I didn't want to do oh that. I wanted to, you know, just figure out how to do my own website. So nice. that's pretty much how I learned web development, and my instructor said, you should do this as a living. So I oh looked it God. up. It pays a little bit more than being a piano teacher, so <laughs> that's what I did. It's a little less artistic, though. <laughs> a little bit, but there's a lot of creativity in uh -huh. development. Yeah, for sure. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of very like creative coding talks at this edition, so that's pretty cool. Yeah. Nice. Hello, hello, Nerd. It says love the base CS podcast, uh, ah. Vidi. Thanks you for creating them. Oh yay! Right, Thank you for listening to them. <laughs> yeah, but tell us a bit.
bit more, like, why did you decide to create the podcast? What, what happened there? Yeah, so I, as I mentioned earlier, my background is not computer science, but I, at some point, was like, oh, I need to... Everybody knows about this stuff, and I don't. No. Uh, that's what I thought. It turns out a lot of people yeah, don't yeah, know Yeah, yeah, I think most of us. <laughs> <laughs> so I just started, like, learning it on my own, and I started a writing series called right. Race Yes, and my okay. friend Saran, she found the writing, and she was like, you know... I think people would like this in podcast format too. Not everybody learns by writing. Yeah. Uh, so we just sort of joined forces. She brought her podcasting experience. So She's cool. so good at it. And I brought the content and then we created this technical podcast. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I love your videos. Thank yeah. you. It's Thank super you. good. They're really fun super to make. Super well produced. Yeah. Thank that's you. awesome. Cool. So we wanted to like talk a little bit, like since we we, you know, we figured that it would uh, be fun to have you two uh, up here at the same time, and we figured like what is the overlap between you two, and I feel like feels like we wanted to talk a little bit about like is computer computer science valuable for a front end developer, because I think that a lot of people uh, ask themselves that uh, like. Uh, a lot of it feels like whenever I see like these boot camps, which are like mm, prepare you for a job kind of thing, they've got like we don't react, learn GraphQL, learn like this and this and this. Like it's very much like focused on like learn these tools because that means that this consulting company can now shove you into this company because they can check these yeah. boxes. Like what do you like? But in a world like 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 that, I think that a lot of people would like to hear a little bit about like why. What is the value of learning more computer science uh, concepts? Or, or just the basic algorithms, or like, yeah. why, do, you, do you guys need to use it on your professional life, or what do you see value in it? Do you want to take this? Uh, your talk sure. was very well this morning, so I'll let you take the lead. Yeah, so I personally think that I, did, I don't have a background in computer science like you, but I did take a couple of classes in college, and one of the important realizations is that a lot of the fundamentals in computer science are present in our everyday work, but we just don't really realize it. And so yeah. what we end up doing is we invent these patterns or pull these libraries and we don't understand that there's a fundamental principle to everything that we do, and understanding those first can make things a lot easier. So I talk a lot about state machines, and I also, in my talk today, I threw a little bit of graph theory in which I mentioned your uh, podcast because um, there are some articles about directed graphs, um, especially uh, distributed systems. You have a great explanation for how those work, and part of that is like uh, some of the principles that X data is based on. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, you could be writing your very first line of code, whether it's HTML or JavaScript or CSS, and like, there's computer science in that. Like, exactly. the DOM is just a tree. Um, like, all the functions you use in JavaScript, like some of the most basic ones, are using algorithms under the hood, and you don't need to know them. Like, you can be productive without knowing it. But at some point, I think either you will run up against it yeah, if you go exactly. off the happy path, if you find a bug, or you're looking at open source code, yeah. uh, or you'll be like, oh, I want to know. Uh, and that's when I think it's really helpful to know. But True. I don't think by any means it has to be learned first. But I think organically, everybody sort of fills in the it's gap. It's supposed to converse with that, right? I, I think it gives you like a lot of flexibility in debugging, especially. Because mm -hmm. like when things break down and it goes outside of the box, as you said, like, of the framework that we have, or like the, the predictable thing, it's always nice to know and figure out, okay, this could be happening because that I know that the JavaScript object come, like behaves like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's also uh, always very useful, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and what do you guys think about like uh, job interviews that use like m computer science algorithms? A lot of people complain about the whiteboard <laughs> interviews. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? Um, I will take this. Uh, my opinion is that uh, it shouldn't be the determining factor, but also I approach it from like a, um, people often tell you you need to like memorize it in order to get a job, but then you're not really learning it. And exactly. I, yeah. I think it should be more focused on like understanding the concept and like a really good job interview would like teach you something you don't know. Like sure. that's, Ooh. that would be helpful for them and you. That's a great but, point. Oh, I yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I remember having to memorize so many big O of N like oh. for sorting the algorithms oh, yeah. and I had no idea like what they you know <laughs> meant or whatever Why but I just knew I that they went for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But what I'm more interested in is 
why, like how do we approach that O of N and what does that mean? Um, but for, for jobs, I don't like those interview questions where it's just trivial knowledge, like the, well, what's the big O of this sorting algorithm? Yeah. Or what is seven plus eight in base negative two, which I was actually asked in an interview. What? And what the I oh have no God. idea how to solve that. I was yes. about to say that for Base negative two, oh I know. Well, well, so base negative two, it's sort of like a, Zero, negative one, two, negative four. So it alternates. And when you add them, you're adding and subtracting some, and it's just really weird. So that kind of knowledge, not really useful anywhere. Right, yeah. But asking questions where it applies directly to your job, especially if there are computer science questions, then I think that that's worth it. Yeah, I find, I find that that is like what I really like about your talk, because it comes when to state machines, ugh, state machines and state charts. That are computer science concepts that are very applicable mm -hmm, to sure. uh, front-end yeah. engineering. Yeah. Like when I was, uh, I was interviewing for Google a couple of uh, years back when I was part of a company that's almost like we hired. So they had like these acquisition consultants training us for the Google interviews, and they pushed so hard for time complexity and uh, recursion. Like you had to know that so like so well because they were pushing that so hard in the questions which are com for sure like somewhat useful concepts but not like the relevance for time complexity in in a in a front end application is not like that's not where your performance problems are going to be so that is like what what concepts do you think are useful for uh, computer science uh, for for front end engineers in particular like apart from like state charts and state machines uh, well, so time complexity can be useful in some instances. For example, you took computer science, and I know like you know all of this stuff. But when you see two for loops nested, that's instantly like, okay, yeah, hold yeah. on, Bad time there has there. to be a yeah. better way to do this, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, algorithms such as tree traversal algorithms, like if you tell someone, hey, uh, find the, you know, do a death first search of this tree, they're going to be like, wait, why? What? But if yeah. you ask them, like, find all the paragraph tech, uh, the paragraph tags in this, um, you know, in the DOM, then they're going to be like, oh yeah, how does that work? Guess what? It's a death first search or <laughs> yeah. something like that. So it, sure. it is extremely useful, um, especially for data structures, which yeah. we tend to just store stuff forever on the front end and just yeah. like hope things work. But once we understand data structures, we realize that there's things like linked lists and, well, finite state machines um, and things like queues that could really help yeah. us, oh, yeah. you know, with our, you know, with whatever tasks we're doing. Yeah. What do you think? Do you um, think there's any other uh, algorithms that not only are good for like preparing for interviews, because that shouldn't be like the ultimate goal, but like being better at your job as a front-end developer? Um, as far as algorithms, I don't, I don't think there are any algorithms that I have learned specifically, except for binary search, uh -huh. where I was like, oh yes, I can pull this out, and finally, this is yeah. accurate. Like that doesn't really happen. Um, it's nice to know them. Binary search actually like. Git bisect runs binary search, yeah. so it's uh, like true. Yeah, uh, you, I actually use it all the time. Yeah. But um, I agree with you know your opinion completely, which is that like you you are using it, um, you just don't know it yet. You don't yeah. know it, and yeah. so when the time comes for you to learn it, it's super helpful. And I I concur on like the trees, uh, state machines. Data structures are just really helpful. Like the day that I understood what a stack was, no, I understood yeah. like how programs work because I was like, oh, stack Mind frames. Yeah. That's what's happening. That's all it is. So yeah. it's, it's like I almost want to encourage it because it's a very empowering thing to right, learn. And yeah. I think like when you get over the hump of learning some of these fundamental concepts like data structures or even algorithms. It, everything becomes a little less scary because right, you start yeah. to just see it as a shape of a thing you've already seen before. Sure. I'd like to stay on the scary part. Uh, <laughs> I always do. Uh, like, uh, because a lot of people uh, like, the, that I run into have like this anxiety around like, oh my god, there's a new framework coming out kind of thing. And I just feel like I, that some years ago I just stopped having that anxiety and realized a little bit because it was like because I've started they started seeing like the underlying patterns. So when something like Vue comes along, you kind of just see like, oh, it's like this adaptation of this, but with this slight variation. While if you're just like in like the React world and doesn't understand like how it fits into a like the cohesiveness that it fits into, like that means that your entire existence is pulled out from right under you, yeah. and that's super fucking scary. Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> Shame. Uh, and uh, like, like, I feel like a lot of like going deep, especially when you're talking about the uh, object model, mm -hmm. that gives you like this, this, this nice fuzzy feeling of foundation. That I you know can stand things. On. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, I think t to your point, um, when a lot of developers are like very married to one way of doing things, yeah. especially oh, yeah. in the framework wars, oh. I, I can't ever wrap my head around that because. Frameworks keep changing, and more importantly, all the frameworks learn from each other. So exactly. if you really no, like take a step back and look at them, you'll notice like Ember has learned from Angular, and React has done something, yes. and Ember pulled that in, and then For sure, you yeah. know some people have learned from Vue and Svelte, which I didn't even really know anything about <laughs> until today. Yeah. So it's 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 sort of like taking the step back and realizing actually at the core, the fundamentals, they're all the same, and some of the patterns are also the same too. Yeah. And so you're more empowered, like tomorrow if you need to suddenly switch what you're doing, you have the tools to help you navigate that. You're not lost and blind and like trying to figure it out on your own. Exactly. True. Yeah, and on that same thought, I find it scary too when it's like, all right, here's a new framework, how do I do this in this framework? But once I started uh, first focusing on patterns, like you said, and taking a step back and saying, all right, how would I solve this without a framework? Like, how would I solve it just conceptually? Exactly. What kind of data structures would I have? How would I do like reactive updates? Then a framework just becomes a way to apply those. Yeah, and then exactly. frameworks become so much less scary because it's like if someone said, here's vanilla, now here's chocolate, now here's pistachio, you shouldn't be scared of that. You should say, okay, I don't care what those are, I could put it on a cone and eat it. Exactly, it's pistachio is great, right? <laughs> uh, it's no, but it's a really, it's a really good point because I think like when you, and going back to the whole like concepts instead of uh, like uh, direct things such as frameworks, I, I think the whole thing just becomes so much easier when you get a grasp on, okay, but what is reactive programming? Because then like you could just figure out what React does without never having actually coded React. So like when you do understand like the base concepts in computing, which not necessarily are going to be like algorithms per se or computer science things, but when you do understand like coding paradigms, functional programming, imperative, imperative programming, and you know like what the baseline different is, then it becomes so much easier to navigate the new stuff that's coming around. Yeah. Uh, I love this. Like that's so nice of Corfasti. I love the points they're making. Like when David pointed out that that switch is a finite state machine during his talk, that was such a aha uh -huh. moment of it for me. For sure. Guys, if you have any questions for David or Vaidehi, like please uh, post them on the on the stream. We're constantly like yeah. reading up on the things that you write, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to to answer. We'll try. <laughs> but yeah, there, there was an interesting point in the chat actually. Like sometimes functional programming is also used in front end, uh, and declarative programming doesn't take into traditional imperative approach. I think that. What helps me, and especially because I think functional programming is a little scary, I, I do it a lot, but the whole category thing, I don't know what a monoid is, a monad, whatever, <laughs> like I've heard so yeah, many yeah. different explanations. Monad, gonad, and I always understand it for like five seconds and then it just yeah, for sure. withers away. But the idea is we should be pragmatic first. Yeah. Apply patterns, do them. Don't even think about, okay, which which category thing am I using or which uh, solid design pattern from object-oriented programming am I using, but just solve the problem exactly. and then you layer the pattern on top and you're like, okay, this fits within this pattern. This is a great point, actually. That is so cool. Yeah, I think it's like when it comes to uh, functional programming, it's, it's an interesting world because there are some concepts there that are tremendously useful and tremendously simple, like math, for instance. Like, yeah. That's, uh, after you learn that, you go like, okay, I understand immediately how this can be useful. But then you come to Monas, which is kind of like, oh, it's a promise, but it's like the general version There's of the promise. There's a maybe, yeah, I don't it's get like, things. And the yeah. kind of use case becomes like less clear, and yeah. it can do streams, and like, like it starts becoming a little bit harder to navigate. Uh, and it feels like, like it would be very nice if somebody has made a little bit of a map of what yeah, these concepts are, I found like a useful case for these. But these here, perhaps we don't need to learn them and perhaps we don't need to shove them into our code. Yeah. Whenever I use, just for yeah, the sake of doing. Yeah. Whenever I use Ramda, I just find myself in this kind of like, maybe there's a Ramda I can use for this. I thing. literally like, yeah. uh, waste half an hour every day trying to figure out what's the perfect Ramda function for the things that I'm doing. So thank you so yeah, much for that. It's basically like the, the, the Ramda documentation is basically the Pinterest of programming. It's awesome.
But going back to interviews, can you guys think of what was the worst interview of your entire career, <laughs> if you're share, comfortable in sharing? Oh, yeah, sure. I remember. I, will, I, I try to forget it. I can't forget <laughs> it. Uh, it was um, to code. So I don't know any PHP. I've never written PHP. Okay. But in this interview, and they knew that, and it was the end of like a five-hour long interview. The last half an hour was uh, code Conway's Game of Life in PHP. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> genetic algorithms. No. Yeah, I, I was like, Conway's what? Yeah. Oh my I didn't God. get beyond that. I didn't even know what the pro problem Jesus. was. <laughs> Uh, so I never got to really writing PHP, but that, yeah. that oh was my god. worst interview. Oh god, I just want to hug tough. myself. <laughs> like, it's like, oh god, I want to take a shower. Oh my god. That's so bad. That's yeah, um, I got to say, one of my, I, I don't know, because it was actually a great interview. It's just the interview problem that they gave me, and I'm definitely not going to name the company here. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to trash in life. Right, nothing to do with, oh, what's this uh, big O of N notation or anything computer science-y like that, but it was more, hey, make this simple component in this React app that we have. And I was like, OK, I know how to do this. I could spin up a Create React app and do it in literally half an hour. Went in their code base, oh my god. It was <laughs> like, first of all, I, w I asked, what are they using for styles? They're like, oh, we, j we made our own thing. It's oh, like style components. I but I'm like, all right, well, what about state management? Uh, we have something sort of like Flux. It's a little like Redux. I'm like, why not just do that? Why don't you do it? And so, um, long story short, it was over-engineered to the point of no return. And I knew that just oh trying. God. And this is why I'm so thankful that some companies have you work in their code base as part of a uh, like part of the job interview. Mm -hmm. And I just said like, I would not be happy working in this code base. <laughs> oh my God. So. I, I, I said, I, I oh can't Oh, my God. So basically, they didn't bomb you. You bombed them. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's awesome. Wow. That's shocking. Well, but that's, uh, thank you guys so much for sharing. That was, uh, that was very brave of you. Wow. I feel like, uh, so, Zendel's boy, I feel like advanced functional programming school for personal project, but all for, for real work with multiple developers of varying kinds of knowledge. Littering of not code base with monads is kind of a disservice to any juniors unless a category theory stuff is solving a problem that wouldn't be otherwise be possible to solve without it. Yeah, I think because the, the, the thing that we were just talking, like when you use things just for the sake of using, you're being perhaps disregarding how much your team actually knows about the thing that you're excited about. And that becomes like a code that's hard to reason about. Or Yeah. Have you guys had any uh, experiences with like good practices in, in like team uh, management in the sense of like everybody's on the same page with the technologies that you're using or how do you get there? Uh, yeah, so my opinion on this actually is that junior developers could be some of the most valuable developers in your organization because uh, like a lot of the times we think, okay, uh, the junior doesn't understand this so we should, um, you know, we have to spend time teaching them, blah, 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 but that's actually an asset because if a junior developer doesn't understand something or doesn't understand True. the code that you wrote, then guess what? Your code is not good enough oh, to yeah. be more organized. Yeah, quality yeah. test for I your code base. Oh I my god, that's such a good love point. This. And, and even at Microsoft, we encourage each other to to teach each other, not to throw something that someone might not understand. Like for that's sure. doing a disservice to the rest of our team. Exactly. That's a really great point. Yeah, I think that that is a great counterpoint to the whole, won't somebody think of the juniors? What is the junior? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Which is also a great question. How do you guys uh, think is the best way to mentor and like get juniors to, to eventually grow in their careers like mid-developers? Is there any uh, good practices that you'd like to share, or how do you do that? Uh, let them do the typing, uh, and don't give them the answers, even though you know them. I think oh, a I've seen a lot of, I think those are like the two rules that are on the top of my mind. I'm sure there's more, but like I see a lot of engineers who are mentoring, but what they're really doing is like they're they're cutting short the experience of learning because they're like, oh, I know the answer. Or let me just uh, take over and type. Oh, and I think yeah. that the growth, exactly. the real learning happens is when you sort of prompt them and you're like, oh, I wonder why that's not working. Should we try something? But like, oh, yeah. oh, let them drive amazing. it. Let them do the exploration and learning because if if you just type it for them, it's easy for you, but you're taking away yeah. that opportunity for them to figure out exactly. and like have you that might learning. Exactly, you well have done it yourself. Yeah. Yes, exactly. exactly. You're losing that aha moment, you know? So. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and that's why um, when teaching junior developers, stay away from jQuery, stay away from React or Vue or any of those frameworks. Like, teach them the hard way. Have them do it like manually using the native APIs, and then tell them, 
guess what, I'm sorry you're gonna hate me, but there's an easier way to do this, but I really want you to learn this. Yeah, for sure, that's awesome. So if you could go back in time and tell yourself one piece of advice when you were a junior developer, what would that be? Oh, I have to go first. Uh. <laughs> no, it could be anything like a, Yeah, uh, not necessarily technical, but like something that's gonna help mm. you like grow faster perhaps or, or yeah, deal better with the situation that you went through. I don't know if it's so much advice as it is reassurance, but I would tell myself that you are capable of learning more than you think you can. Mm. Uh, I think especially at the beginning, I had this feeling of the, the mountain of things I don't know is way bigger than the things I do know. Uh, and so it felt kind of like this daunting task. And like, for example, with computer science or distributed systems or a new framework or a new language, it, when you're starting out, it sort of feels like, how will I ever yeah. do this? Like, I'm never going to be able to do this. I'm not capable. Um, but if I could tell myself, like, yes, actually you are, it's going to be a little hard, but you will get through it. Like, you have grit and perseverance. You'll get through it. That would have been reassuring. I don't think it would have made anything easier or faster, but at least I would have like been like, all right, I'll get through it. It's a journey. Awesome. Yeah, That's a really good piece of advice. I love it. And yeah. uh, I also love this uh, point by Robert Tables. In a dysfunctional IT organization, a senior developer can be one of the highest risk assets that you can have. That's why I really like the emphasis on well-supported junior, uh, junior devs. Great points, David. Thank yeah, you. one of the one of the scariest things is having a team full of senior developers. Like, <laughs> nothing will get done. It becomes Absolutely basically an nothing. eagle battle all the time. <laughs> right, right. But if I if I went back in time and gave myself advice, it would be don't try to rewrite Lodash and SAS. That was a fun <laughs> little uh, side that was project a that idea took, past David. took many hours of my <laughs> life. No, but going to Vidahi's points, it's more. Uh, you're, you could learn more than you think you know, and um, just be more well-rounded, like experiment with more server-side languages okay. and uh, the command line. I'm still a command line beginner, to okay. be honest. I just try to do things with a GUI as much as possible. <laughs> I know my my CD and my Git's yeah. whatever. I, I, I know all those. But Perfect. yeah, just be more well-rounded. You get by. OK, so to close off this amazing interview, one last question. If you could be any algorithms, what algorithm would you be? I feel like a lot of people on the internet are going to make fun of me for this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Bubble sort? Uh, one, because everybody hates on it so much. And two, bubbles. I feel like if adorable. I was bubble yeah. sort, adorable. bubbles I would be involved. And then I'd just be in my own little corner where everybody's like, nobody likes you. But I'd be like, it's OK, because I have bubbles. <laughs> Anyways, showing some love for love poor it. bubble sort. Awesome. I would be a Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay. Oh, nice. Because, first Fancy. of all, just like my last name, his name is also impossible to spell. Okay. <laughs> and also, I'm very lazy. I want to get from point A to point B as fast as possible. Amazing. So. Well, great answer. What would you be? Oh, uh, I, I was like it. Uh, <laughs> no, I think I would be like, a, like some kind of tree search algorithm, uh, because that is one of the first algorithms that I learned where I actually like, ooh, this is cool, and then I could actually use it for a, a Spotify interview problem. <laughs> and then I actually never used that during my five years there, but it's like still. Amazing. Cool. And what you? about you? I, uh, I would be a red black tree, because ooh. it's very fashionable. <laughs> it suits my personality. Nice. Cool. Thank you guys so much for being here on this our live stream. Awesome. It was amazing to have you. Hope you have a great time at the conference still. And we'll see you around. Thank you very much for having us. It's been really fun. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. And hello to all the Fun Fun Function fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the uh, the talks of, uh, are going to be available on the Nordic JS YouTube yes. channel after Shortly. this. And the live stream is going to be available in its archive form uh, after we go off air as well on the Twitch channel. Exactly. Tune in. They're actually very fast. So. OK. So we have five more minutes of talking. We can actually uh, look at questions, perhaps. Oh. All right. OK. Uh, we have portraits. No, like we can actually go by uh, earlier. Uh, hello, Nerthis. Uh, <laughs> hello, Nerthis. As uh, you reflected on the fact that GraphQL can be slow on larger projects, for, for, uh, for, for like, like is it though? Like, why would it be uh, a bit like slower on larger projects? 
Is it just because the data sets are... are uh... <laughs> I never had any issues. No, because I feel like it's... like Because it's it, a it's... middle thing between the API call and the response. Yeah, precisely. It should do it like should make your project faster for for most parts like depending on like all the cases where I've uh, replaced the rest API with the uh, graph with graphql the API it's, it's always turned out faster because you can do it in fewer queries okay uh, so ah uh, that's a good question what pieces of tech or what are you excited about learning right now uh, distributed systems uh -huh. that's what I'm learning I'm trying to teach myself because okay. I don't work Perfect. with a very distributed system, but it kind of, I guess everything's distributed, but um, I don't know too much about it. I'm trying to learn more about it. Okay. So that's what I'm excited about. Okay, but uh, why did you decide to start learning about it? Because you were already using, or was there anything else that happened that I got think, you like, hmm, I, I think learn uh, that. when you're like working on like the ops side of a app um, or a product, like you start to realize that there are a lot of problems that uh -huh, are caused by yeah. things being distributed. And, sure. and then I was like, oh, there's no such thing as a global clock. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Time's not a thing. Yeah. This is interesting. Oh, yeah. This is a thing. Yeah. So I was basically hooked. Awesome. Um, I don't know that I have too many answers. I think I've just learned that there are distributed okay. systems are hard, okay. and there are a lot of things that make them hard. But that's what makes them fun to learn about. Fair enough. Yeah. What about you, David? So I might actually steal your answer because uh, <laughs> it's sort of distributed systems, but on the more theoretical level, I've been digging into the actor model, which is Ooh. the basis of so many distributed systems, like. Erlang, Elixir, um, Akka. Can you explain us what the actor model right, actually so is? so actor model gave me one of the biggest ahas after finite state machines gave uh -huh. me that initial aha. Uh -huh. And so the actor model, it's essentially you're an actor, I'm an actor, you're an actor, you're an actor. We're all actors and we're all sending each other messages. And so that way we don't have this sort of conflict of you can't read my mind. You know, you can't read my mind. Ah. I cannot. In, I cannot directly influence your decisions. I could just talk to you, so that's sending you a message, and you could react based on that message. But okay. so it's sort of the concept of local mutability. Like nothing else can touch your local state except you. And you just you could send messages, you could receive messages, and when you simplify programming and distributed systems down to that, like this whole message passing idea, things just makes so much more sense. Is it kind of like a pub sub kind of thing? Yeah, in like a, a way. Publish, subscribe, in a way, yeah. It is like pub sub. Awesome. So you're never directly like manipulating anything. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's it's less side effects in a way. Yeah, right. like yeah. I, I, is it like it sounds to me like it's a structure imposed on top of a pub sub architecture, like how you're like you're not allowed to send messages in a certain way or maintain state. Sort of, yeah. It, it is like pub sub, but instead of the the pull method, it's a push. So, oh, yeah. you know, we could spawn actors or we could have references to actors and we could just push messages onto them. And it fits like directly into distributed systems. Oh, okay. Sounds like I know what I'm supposed to learn about next. Yeah. Actor model. It's nice to inspire each other. <laughs> Actually, I have terrible nightmares about PubSub because back in Angular 1, mm. there was this thing called the broadcast and the emit. And oh. That oh, created yes. a mess uh, <laughs> together with a yeah yes, double two-way binding things anyway. Oh, two-way anyway. data binding. It doesn't mean that the whole architecture is flawed. It means that in that case, it didn't work very well, at least for me. So I think we are now coming back shortly. Yeah, I think so. Like, do you know. want to watch the talks? Or do you uh, like uh, if if you want to go <laughs> actually <laughs> and get a seat? We're keeping you. It's fine. Thank you guys so much. No, not for real. Okay. And we're going to leave you two watching the talk. So thank you. Thank and you.